Welcome back to Planet Doug behind the scenes for Wednesday, November 23rd. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning, a bit later than normal. I had a whole bunch of things I was doing as soon as I leaped out of bed this morning. So I've been uh, busy for a few hours already. Yeah, quite a few things going on. Uh, quick technology update. Um, previous videos I was talking about some problems I was having with Wi-Fi and that led to problems with getting Cellcom internet data, all of my adventures there. I'm happy to report that those problems are now in the past because the Wi-Fi has returned and it has returned with a vengeance. I just did a test using the uh, speed test app and the current, like this, this minute right now, the download speed is 200 megabytes per second. So you can't possibly need faster uh, downloads than that. And upload is 84 megabytes per second. So we are back in business as far as that is concerned. And that's kind of a relief. Makes my life a lot easier. I guess at the hotel, they called their service provider, whoever it is that provides this service to hotels. They had to come out and check in and find out what the issue is. And I have no idea what the issue could be, but the technician worked his magic. He showed up here, checked into whatever was going on, and I guess there was a problem of some kind. Can't imagine what the problem was, but whatever it was, it's now gone. So we are back online with a vengeance. 200 megabyte speed downloads. That's pretty amazing. And um, I checked uh, the other day, and I actually got as high as 200 megabytes upload as well. But that was just for a brief time. It usually settles in at around 100 megabytes per second. So 200 download, 100 upload, you're not going to get better than that. So uh, I'm, I'm happy as far as that is concerned. My other technology problem involved my assortment of portable hard drives. I have five of them. I didn't even know how many I had after I shot that video and talked about it. I, I did a count and I've ended up with five of them mainly because I wasn't expecting to be gone from Thailand, for, from Malaysia for so long when I went to Myanmar, then the pandemic happened. So I left portable hard drives in storage here. And then when I got to Myanmar and then Thailand, I ran out of storage, I ran out of room. So I bought new portable hard drives while I was in Thailand. So I've ended up with five of them. And they're all um, Seagate. These are all Seagate hard drives, two terabytes each. And um, I guess one of them is failing. One of my main ones, the blue one, has been failing lately. Um, it sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't, but I don't trust it anymore. So I've been moving on to other uh, drives. I'm sort of getting my world of portable hard drives organized. And I discovered another problem, which is, again is a complete mystery and has led to a huge time commitment on my part because the the um, portable hard drives that I left in storage here in uh, Malaysia, there's something weird going on with them. I can't, is it two of them? Yeah, there's two of them that I left in storage here. And I guess they were formatted on my old computer, I think. Yeah, they would have been formatted on my old computer. And I didn't do anything special with them. I didn't set any restrictions, there was no privacy, there was no security. I just plugged them into that computer, formatted them, and I was using them ever since, you know, whether with a phone or with my old laptop. But now, for whatever reason, whenever I plug them into one of my phones or my laptop, I, I do not have read-write privileges. Well, I don't have, I have reading privileges. I can go into these hard drives and I can open the files and I can copy them, but I can't change anything. So I can't delete anything. I try and try and try. And every time I try to delete old files to clear up memory, I get an error message that says, no, you don't have permission to do that. And that of course sent me down the rabbit hole of, well, how in the world do I fix that? And as far as I can tell, there was no way to fix it. It was just impossible to do. I couldn't find any information online. It's like. Again, it's one of these technology problems that I always seem to have that it's even difficult to explain what the problem is. I mean, what do you search for on Google? What do you tell someone the problem is? It's, such, it's so complicated. It's like, well, I have portable hard drives and I can't get into them. I cannot delete any files. 
I, I, I just don't have any um, privileges on there. And then, and then to explain the history of it and why it's not working is very complicated. And then people will tell you things. Well, you just have to log in as the administrator, and then now you have full privileges. And I, well, I'm logged in on all my devices as the administrator. I'm the only person that ever uses any of this stuff, all my phones, tablets, laptops, everything. I'm the only person that ever touches any of them. There are no other users. I have full administrative controls of everything. So it's not like I'm logging in as an unknown user and trying to do it. No, I'm logged in as the administrator on all my devices, and yet I still cannot get into my hard drives because they tell me that I'm not the administrator for this hard drive. I've never run into that before. And um, the only solution I could come up with that I could think about is maybe I can just reformat them. Like that's the only thing I could think of as a possibility. But the only way I can reformat them is to first take everything on there that I need to keep and copy them somewhere else. So I've got to basically copy everything on this portable drive onto another portable drive first and then I can try to format it. And that took a long time. Man, what a job that is to, to like archiving stuff and, and backing up stuff and keeping stuff safe. It's a, it's a time consuming job as anyone would know. But anyway, I sat down and I did that yesterday and the day before and maybe even the day before. It feels like it's been going on forever. I had to take my two hard drives that I left in storage and basically find room elsewhere to copy everything that's on these drives somewhere else temporarily to keep them safe. And I, I did that and I finally got this one down to when it was ready to go. And then I plugged it into my uh, MacBook and wiped it clean. You know, um, I figured out how to do that on a MacBook. It's, even, even that is a bit of a mystery to me. I don't know anything about Macs even now. It's uh, that whole world of MacBooks is, is incomprehensible to me. I'm just so used to everything on Windows where everything seems so easy to do. But on the MacBook, I keep running into problems. It's just weird how they operate, in my humble opinion. Um, yeah, I'm not a Mac guy. But anyway, I do own a Mac. So yes, I am a Mac guy and I'm, I learn, I'm learning, learning slowly. But I found out how to do it and I went into the system and I was so happy to find out that after all that work, even though I don't have administrative privileges to modify anything that's on the disk, I was able to take the nuclear option and just wipe it clean and start over again. So using my Mac, I was able to wipe it clean and reformat it and start from scratch. And now I have full access to this hard drive all over again. I had to do that with one and I had to do that with a second one. And that, that was a major project and uh, it's now done. So that particular, those two technology problems are finished. My Wi-Fi problem has been solved, temporarily at least, and my portable hard drive problem has been solved. So, yeah, update, technology update. And in the last behind the scenes video, I was talking about my new plan, potential plan to go to Sumatra, either on a quick visa run, a, a moderate visa run with a backpack, or third option, a, a bike tour. And I talked in depth about all the options and the variables for this thing. And when I finally got to the point of considering taking my bike to Sumatra, it's, it's a lot easier to go by boat, as I talked about, to take a ferry across, because then you can just ride your bike to the, to the dock. And there's the boat, and they just grab your bike, and they roll it onto the boat, and away you go. If you take it to the airport, of course, you have to put the bike inside a box carry that huge heavy box to the airport on a, you know, how do you even get the box to the airport? How do you carry it around? It's a big project. So I wanted to go by ferry. If I'm going to take my bike to Sumatra, I would like to go by ferry. It's just easier and it's more fun, way, way more fun than uh, flying. That's for sure. But then I ran into a problem of visa on arrival because I would have to get a visa on arrival. And my normal arrival point in Sumatra is a small town called Tanjung Balai. It's Tanjung Balai Asahan near Madan on the coast of the main, you know, main island of Sumatra. And uh, I know from experience they do not have a visa on arrival facility there. They do have an immigration office, so you can arrive as a foreigner there, at least you could in the past but um, they would not issue a visa on arrival. 
At this point, I don't know if it's open at all for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Um, so then I was <clears throat> thinking that um, I could go to another town, a uh, place called uh, Dumai, which you can get to two different ways, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, was it yesterday? Maybe yesterday or the day before. I think it was the day before. <laughs> I've lost all track of time. I think on Monday, yeah, it was on Monday, I decided to settle this question of whether there were even fairies at all in uh, Klang. Are there, are there any fairies still running from Klang to uh, Sumatra, whether to Tanjung Balai or to uh, Dumai at all? And uh, I couldn't find any confirmed information online. The internet was of no help. So I thought, ah, I was feeling full of energy. I, I, I was in the mood for a train ride. So I hopped on the train and I took the train. It's about an hour and a half journey from here in Kuala Lumpur to the port town of Klang. I took the train, KTM train, down to Klang. All my connections worked out perfectly. Very pleasant ride. I was tired though. I hadn't slept that night. I was exhausted on the train for this whole trip, but I still enjoyed it. I got to Klang. And when you arrive at the Klang, not, not Klang town, but Port Klang, that's the final uh, station of the, that KTM line, you get to Port Klang. It's called in, in Malay something like Pehemembang, or I don't know. There's another word, the Malay word for port, but it's Port Klang. And the station is right beside the ferry terminals. And there's two ferry terminals. There's one, the local domestic terminal, and that's for all the boats, the local tourist boats that go out to Pulau Katem, all those islands off the coast of Klang. And it's a very popular day trip, you know, for people to go there, have seafood. There, it's a big tourist destination. I went there myself before. And then there's another ferry terminal, another dock basically, and that is for the bigger boats, the international boats that go to uh, Malay, to uh, Sumatra and back. And as soon as I came out of the train station, I turned the corner, walking up the street. Even from a distance, I knew, nah, this place is shut down. Because as you approach it, I can see the building, but then there's a big entrance into a parking area. And it, was no it would normally be open in the past, you know, cars moving in and out, motorcycles going in and out, people moving in and out. And there was just a big gate across the entrance, locked and there were no people that uh, visible that I could see. There's nobody going in and out. There was no activity. So even from a distance, it was like, ah. No, that does not look good. Clang is not looking good. And I walked around and there was another entrance I found that was open. And I guess even though the port was, the ferry port, the dock was closed, um, it, they, you could still access the parking area to go to Pulau Katem. So they had another entrance where you could park your car and I walked in through that entrance and I went up to the, the official building and I could see the ticket windows for Jetstar ferries and other, other companies that offer ferry trips out of there. And they were all empty, doors locked, everything's covered in dust and dirt, been shut down basically for the two, three years of the pandemic. And I found two very friendly uh, security guards there they were just, you know, they were, you know, they were there and I had a chat with them and they were very happy to talk with me and they explained that no, this whole thing has been shut down for two or three years. But they did say um, that as far as they're aware, the ferries are still running to Dumai. Now you could still go to Sumatra by boat, just not from Klang. You could still make the trip, but you would have to go to either Port Dixon or to Malacca. And they, of course, are not, you know, they're not in charge of these ferries. You know, I, I, I'm not going to take them at their word, but they, according to their knowledge, their experience, they says, yes, uh, Malacca and Port Dixon are open and you can take ferries from there to Sumatra. So, yeah, it was a very uh, useful trip to take. I went all the way down there and found out that, A, the Klang ferries are not running. I saw that with my own eyes, so I'm 100% sure that there are no international ferries running out of Port Klang at the moment, and there's no information about when it might start up again. But Port Dixon and Malacca, in theory, they are open and operational and running ferries across to Sumatra, to Dumai, and maybe to other places. So that, that was a very uh, helpful trip for me.
And when I came back to Kuala Lumpur, I started doing more research into it because I wanted to find out for sure. And it wasn't very easy to do because, again, the internet is a weird place. You'd think it would be the source of all information, and it is, but it's also a source of a lot of misinformation and, and problems, you know. I found out the names of some of the ferry companies that operate out of uh, Malacca and uh, Port Dixon. And then I go to their websites, and then their websites just don't work. As far as, you know, everything looked like ferries were running. There was even some schedules that I found online. But then when I went to the official, like, Indo, Indo Mall Fast Ferry, I think is one of them. Indo Mall Fast Ferry. I feel like I'm missing one syllable in that name, but something like that. Indomal Fast Ferry. You go to their website, the official website, and it says, you know, you can look at their schedule. And, and the, the schedule tells you the days of the week and the times for the different boats, but it doesn't say anything about the year, right? So you have no idea this, this schedule could be from 10 years ago or three years ago. We have no idea whether that's a current schedule or not, but there was a schedule there. But then they had a tab where you can book your tickets um, to you know, make it official. So I went into the booking section and all I got there were error messages. No matter what date I put in, what departure point, what arrival point, every, t every attempt I made to actually get official booking information, it all just said there's no, no ticket prices and no ferries on that date that are available. So every date I checked came back with said, no, there's nothing, nothing available, nothing available. So I thought, oh, so maybe that's another dead end. But then I always forget about this option for some reason. I went to Facebook and I went to their Indomal Fast Ferry Facebook page. And there's another one, Tunas Rapat, I think is the other one. They may even be the same company. They're, they seem to be related. It was all a little bit mysterious. And I went to the Tunas Rapat and the Indomal, Indomal uh, Facebook pages, and there I was getting current information because Indomal, I think, had a post on their Facebook page that said, during the Malaysian general elections of 2022, they have a temporary new schedule, and this is the schedule for the election period. So that was very, very, very current. Obviously, there was no mistaking 2022 Malaysian general elections. Here is our schedule for the election period. So that told me that ferries were absolutely running now. So, and I spent a lot more time on their Facebook pages. Um, I sent messages, I sent emails. I, you never get replies to anything anymore. I mean, they always have a WhatsApp you know, way to contact them, a messenger way to contact them, a Facebook page, email addresses, and you can use all that stuff as much as you want. It's very rare that anyone ever replies. And of course, what you're expected to do is call them. That's the only thing you can do really is call people. But I never do that because once I get someone on the phone, I can't hear them. I have no idea what they're saying. And it's just a giant waste of time. So I never even try anymore. So yeah, so that was looking good. So if I do want to go to Sumatra for a bike tour, there is a possibility. And it would, it would basically mean giving up my room here at the Kojoy Hotel fully, you know, just packing up everything, leaving this place, and then getting on my bike and riding my bike to Malacca, probably, spending a few days in Malacca and then while I'm in Malacca, Malacca, as soon as I get there, I'll book a ferry ticket that'll take me across to uh, Indonesia. So assuming I want to do this, I haven't committed to this idea yet, but I'm pretty, pretty darn excited about it. Despite the fact that this is the worst time of year to go anywhere because it's raining in Sumatra, it's raining in Malaysia. It's the rainy season apparently, but uh, you know, you, you basically, you take the season you, you are handed. If you always wait for the, you know, the best time to go anywhere, you'll probably never go anywhere, you know. This is the time that's available to me, so I should probably just, eh, you know. Rainy season is not always bad, as I talked about in the other video. Rainy season can actually have advantages over the dry season. Sure, in the dry season, it's not raining as much, but it's also the busy season, and it's also, you know, kind of, the fields and everything will not be full of crops, you know. So the rainy season can be, has advantages going in the rainy season. 
just when it rains, you just uh, pull over to the side of the road and take shelter until the rain stops. And hopefully you're not sleeping in your tent at night when the rain comes pouring down. And what I often try to do anyway, even when I set up my tent, if I'm bike touring, I always try to put my tent underneath another shelter. So I do sleep in my tent, but I like to find a rest stop, any kind of an abandoned building at the side of the road or anything. And then you put your tent inside underneath a roof so that even if it does rain, then uh, you don't depend entirely on your tent being waterproof because my tent, or as I should say, my tents, because I have two of them, uh, may or may not be waterproof anymore because they've been in storage for so long. So that brings me to the topic of my tents. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a, for a second. It's kind of a funny story because um, I had my tents in storage here. And as I said, I have two of them. Long story, but I had an MSR Hubba Hubba NX two-person tent. And it, um, long, long story, my original MSR Hubba Hubba was also put in storage and it melted. It just completely turned into goo. You know, when I came back, you know, I tried to take it out. It was just all stuck together. The tent had been completely destroyed by the heat and humidity. That was back in Indonesia. And I needed a tent at the time. So when I was in Indonesia, I bought a tent to be used temporarily. Or I bought the best tent I could find in Indonesia. I ordered it online. It was a Big Agnes tent, another very reputable company. So I bought this Big Agnes tent. And then I used that when I was in Sumatra. And then when I came back to Kuala Lumpur, I, I actually contacted MSR and said, yeah, I've got a Hubba Hubba NX tent. And I, you know, it just melted. You know, the whole thing is just turned into glue, you know, like, is there anything I can do? Uh, like, I thought maybe I could just buy the body of the tent, but keep the poles because the poles were still in good condition. The tent pegs, the poles, the ropes, all of that was okay. And I thought maybe it'd be cheaper just to buy the body of the tent and I can use all the other stuff and I don't have to pay full price. But MSR wrote back and says, well, we'll give you a whole tent for free. So they covered it on under warranty and they sent me a brand new MSR Hubba Hubba NX, which was very generous of them. And then that's how I ended up with two tents, the MSR Hubba Hubba and a Big Agnes. And those two tents were in storage here in Malaysia a second time because I got stuck in uh, Thailand during the pandemic. And when I came back, my Hubba Hubba has suffered a lot of damage. Um, so it's not clear whether it's usable or not. The, mainly the tent body seems to have suffered the most. In particular, the tent floor is really sticky to the touch. But that seems to be a problem with MSR tents in general. The coatings they put on them are not that durable. They, they, they're affected by heat and humidity and they become sticky and, and weird. And all of the seam tape on the seams, you know, to waterproof the seams, all of that has just turned into dust. Um, I set up the tent again the other day just to check it out. Then it was filled with um, dust and dirt because of all the, the uh, seam tape has just disintegrated and it all comes flaking off. So it suffered a lot of damage. And then yesterday I thought I should um, compare it to my Big Agnes tent. And I looked at my Big Agnes tent. It had been in storage for the exact same amount of time. And yet the material of the Big Agnes, uh, I'll grab it for a minute and show you what it looks like. This is the uh, Big Agnes tent. And the material, it feels dry. Even on the inside, it, it's kind of just a tiny bit maybe on the bottom. But when I set up the tent and I opened it up and then I was checking the interior, the, uh, the floor of the tent, there's the floor, feels okay. It's not sticky. So these two tents, the Big Agnes and the MSR were in storage, same place, same conditions, same length of time, the MSR. The, the coating on the tent material just disintegrated, turned into gooey, sticky stuff, and the Big Agnes uh, did not. And even the seam tape, this is the seam tape on the inside of the Big Agnes. It doesn't look brand new, but still in good condition. Look at that. It hasn't flaked, it hasn't turned into dust, and yet on the MSR, this tape just completely disintegrated. So it's kind of interesting. 
But <laughs> the other thing I had to deal with is that um, on both tents, the tent poles had had a problem because the tent poles themselves are fine. They're just made out of you know lightweight aluminum or whatever space age material they're made out of. But they're all held in place with elastic cord on the inside that's called a shock cord. And modern tents, the tent poles all have this shock cord running through the middle so that when you open up the poles, they all just get, they all just snap into position like click, 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 almost automatically. And then when you put the two sections together, the elastic holds them in place. And you really need that. And in both tents, the elastic had completely, basically turned into rope. It had, they had no more elasticity at all. So the cord had to be replaced. And then I went down my usual rabbit holes. Uh, I started with MSR because I still really like that tent. I like the design of it. I like the size of it. I like a lot of things about that tent um, better than the big Agnes that I bought. And, um, I started with MSR and I contacted an MSR distributor who located in Singapore. I've had dealings with them in the past, but they just don't seem to operate anymore. I can't get in touch with them. All of my messages to them just go unanswered and, and undeliverable. So I switched to the MSR rep in Bangkok, but it was the same situation. Uh, none of my messages were replied to or they came back as undeliverable and I couldn't find active email addresses for them. So those were dead ends. And then I decided to contact MSR headquarters, like MSR back in the United States where the company is based. I found, you know, their emails and their contact and support information, all that. And I've been sending them emails as well and I haven't gotten any replies from MSR either. So, yeah. Basically, I didn't really want to do anything on the tent or spend any money on it until I got some information. Like for all I knew, maybe these tents have like a super duper lifetime warranty no matter what. Then maybe because this tent was in storage during the pandemic and it melted, even though I stored it properly. It was a bit of a warm environment, but I did store it in the proper way that you're supposed to. And the tent still melted and I have you know, my own personal experience that that isn't normal because this tent, same conditions, did not melt. So there's something wrong with the MSR system, the way they make their tents. At least, or not wrong with theirs, Big Agnes is better, put it that way. And I wanted to find out, heck, maybe I can get a, you know, maybe there's a, a company here in KL that has a warehouse full of MSR Hubba Hubba NX tents and they'll just replace it or something like that. So anyway, I wanted to contact MSR before I did anything, but I haven't been able to get in touch with MSR itself or any other dealership. So I just sort of gave up on that. And I decided that, well, at the very least, I can replace the shock cord. Replace, you know, I may not be able to replace the tent body or do any of this fancy stuff, but you know, maybe I can just get that fixed. And MSR makes a replacement kit you can buy from MSR and it you know, gives you the full package of replacement elastic cord. And then you can, you know, they'll do it for you. You know, if you send the tent to them, they have a service, you know, well, they'll, they'll do it for you. But of course that would take way too long. So I thought if I could just order the kit myself, then I can change it myself. I watched a bunch of YouTube tutorial videos about how you replace the shock cord in a tent. And it looked like a, you know, not a, not a difficult procedure. It's not complicated. It's just, it's going to take a long time. Well, I should say it's not complicated. It is complicated, but there's nothing difficult about it. It's just complex and takes a long time. You've you got to work through it bit by bit by bit until you get it all done. It takes time, but there, I didn't see any reason why I couldn't do it. But I couldn't really order the MSR um, shock cord. It would take too long for it to get delivered here. And then I started calling around all my camping stores. There's a bunch of them here in, in KL that I frequent. And I didn't want to make the trip all the way out to these stores because they're all hours away. It takes like an hour, hour and a half to get to them. And so it's a whole half a day, hour and a half to get there, shop for an hour, hour and a half, come back. And if it turns out they don't even sell shock cord, then it's like you've wasted half a day. So I'm trying to do the sensible thing, what normal people would do is just phone them, just call them up and ask them. So I made all these phone calls. I'm calling places like uh, Corezone. 
Corzone is you know quite a major uh, camping store here. They deal in mainly imported products like expensive imported gear from MSR, Sea to Summit, you know all these big uh, camping companies. And I know I, I know them. I've been there. I think I even have a membership at Corzone if I remember right. Anyway, so I called up Corzone, I got their phone number, I called them and they answered the phone, but I ran into my usual problem where I could not understand anything they were saying. And they spoke English, I mean their English was perfectly fine, but the problem is me, my ears and my brain and my inability to do this. I'm like, it's like I'm, <laughs> you know, I must look ridiculous when I'm trying to talk on the phone because I got my eyes closed, I'm, I'm all bunched up, I'm like listening as hard as I can. It's like. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand what you just said. And we just go around and around in circles. And, I, and I'm also trying to explain things that the other person usually doesn't know about because I'm, I'm trying to explain my problem and my problems are always unusual ones. I'm never asking the normal question like, do you sell tents? And they'll say, yes, we sell tents. And it's like, okay, that's a normal conversation. Me you know, on Planet Doug, I'm calling them up and I'm saying, well, I have a tent, but the shock cord needs to be replaced in the tent poles. And they're like, oh, you need tent poles. I said, no, 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 I don't need tent poles. I need the shock cord. And they don't know the term shock cord. It's the one I use, I'm familiar with, but it may not be a common term. So I'm like, well, you know, the elastic bands inside the uh, tent poles is worn out, I need to replace them. And they're like, uh, elastic, uh, yeah, we don't have elastic. And I'm like, well, it's not elastic. They're not elastic bands. It's like um, thin bungee cords, you know, the, you know, the rubber cords, like a bungee cord. So, oh, we have bungee cords. Like, well, no, I don't need bungee cords. What I need is, you know, and I'm like, and I, I know everything I need. I know exactly how much I need. Um, for one tent, I need 28 feet and I know the width I need, I need 3.5 millimeter, and it's for tents. So I'm like, I, I know exactly what I need. I was like, I need 28 feet of 3.5 millimeter shock cord for tent poles. And of course, the, uh, the poor person on the other end of the phone, they're like, we, we have no idea what you're talking about. And I, I'm, I'm like saying, okay, yeah, I get it, I get it. Um, I don't even know what I'm talking about half the time and I thank them. Oh, thank you very much for your help. And I just hang up the phone. And the only thing I can ever do is go to the store and look for myself. Even when I go to the store and the clerk comes up to me and says, you know, can I, can I help you? And I, I'm talking to them in person. I can never get them to understand what it is I'm looking for. It's just, it's just the way things go on Planet Doug. I have to physically go there and I walk through the whole store, go up and down every aisle. Like the, again, like the shopping terminator and scanning everything and look to see whether they have what I'm looking for because I, I can't communicate any of this stuff. Anyway, then while I was doing all this internet searching, I saw some listings at the top of my web page for shock cord. It wasn't called shock cord, but it was like tent pole elastic stuff or something. I can't remember the exact phrasing. But it was on Shopee and Lazada. I thought, ah, okay, this, you know, again, I kind of forgot about ordering online locally. But then when I started looking at all of the shock cord that was available, it was all coming from overseas. It was all coming from China. And then uh, I probably wouldn't have enough time to have it shipped from China either. And then I hate ordering stuff from China. There's always some sort of a customs problem, or duty problem, import problem. Um, delivery problem. It's, it's never good. So I try to order locally if I can. Um, so, but I noticed that there was some kind of tent cord thing for sale on Shopee, I think, and it was from Decathlon. And I don't know if this is an international chain, but I know of Decathlon. It's a local, it's here in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, there are Decathlon outlets that sell kind of bargain basement. I mean, it's a big fancy store, but their products are not expensive, 
high-end gear. It's like affordable gear for the average person. Cycling gear, camping gear, running equipment, anything to do like basketball equipment, anything to do with sports, athletics of any kind. And it looked like they had some kind of um, cord that I could use at Decathlon. And I can physically go to Decathlon. So that was my project yesterday. Um, I went to Decathlon in the morning. And that was a funny experience. There's a big outlet near KLCC now. You go to the KLCC uh, uh, MRT station you know, near Patronus Towers, near that whole area. And they're right inside like this fancy shopping mall connected with the Four Seasons Hotel. It looks like a very high-end, expensive place. There's a giant, like giant decathlon. And it seemed like a weird thing to me because I think of Decathlon, as I said, as a low budget outlet. And yet here they were housed in a high end luxury mall next to a luxury hotel. Seemed kind of weird. But anyway, I went into a Decathlon and I had a very, I had a typical Planet Doug experience there because it's a, I think it was a new place. It was like their flagship Decathlon outlet. It was big and modern and new and I think they had new systems in place and one of their new systems was customer service. So all the employees there were definitely trained and under strict orders to be as friendly and helpful and approachable as possible, which I love. I'm all about customer service, <laughs> but they may have gone too far in the other direction with the Cathlon because man, they were chirpy and upbeat. It was like, I'm coming up the escalator and I'm not even at the top. And then I, I hear all these people shouting at, you know, they just like, hey, welcome to Decathlon, welcome. And it was like, like, I don't know, it felt like 15 people were shouting welcome to me, everyone standing up and, 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 and greeting me like I'm a arriving emperor at Decathlon. It was incredible. And then every single department that I went into Every single clerk did the same thing to me everywhere I went. You know, they came up to me all the time, like, can I help you, sir? What are you looking for, sir? You know, can I help you? Can I help you? And as I said, I tried to explain what it is I'm looking for, and I never get anywhere with that. So with store clerks, I usually say, okay, no, no, I don't need any help. I, I know what I'm looking for. And my technique is just to walk up and down the aisles and just look myself, because as soon as someone starts helping me, I just end up getting, getting absolutely nowhere. So I'm trying to do that, but every time I, I, told, I spoke to one clerk and said, oh, thank you very much, but no, I'm okay, I don't need any help. I walk 10 feet and there's another clerk stocking the shelves and that clerk comes running over because I'm walking by without a clerk. And I guess that's a no-no at Decathlon now. And that person comes running, oh, sir, welcome to Decathlon. Uh, what can I help you with today? And I'm like, no, no, it's, a, <laughs> it's okay. I'm, I know what I'm doing, you know, and then I get rid of that clerk and I turn the corner. Ah, sir, sir, welcome to Decathlon. Another one comes running up every, everywhere I went. It was too much. And eventually I just gave in to the inevitable. And I went, I remembered actually, I still had the listing on my phone. So I thought, oh, at least I can show them because now I actually have one, I, when this started happening, I had three clerks standing around me in a circle because one clerk picked me up and said, you know, can I help you, sir? And I said, okay, fine. I'm, I'm trying to explain tent cord, like shock cord, elastic inside tent poles, you know, and he has no idea what I'm talking about. But he escorts me over to the camping area and there's two clerks there in the camping area. And he says, well, they'll know all about this. So now I've got three of them standing in a circle around me, talking to me and trying to understand what it is I'm looking for. And then I remembered, oh, I, I probably have the, in, the, the website still up on my phone. So I opened it up on my phone and I showed them a photograph of this package. And this is what they had for sale. And it says elastic four poles, six meters, 2.5 millimeters. And there was, it's gone now, but there was a big bundle of elastic. And this is it. You probably can't see it very well, but as you can see, elastic. And this was actually designed for tent poles. Pretty amazing. I mean, seriously amazing that I found it. Unbelievable that a place like Decathlon actually sells this. Though it wasn't quite right. 
and I wasn't entirely happy with it because it's 2.5 millimeters and the replacement cord for my tens is supposed to be around four millimeters, um, four, 3.5 to four millimeters thick, just in terms of the strength of the elasticity and the durability of it, and that, that's kind of what, if you ordered it from MSR, you're getting 3.5 millimeter shock cord, you know, designed to work with these tents, and this is 2.5 millimeters. So when I was looking at it, and originally I didn't think it would work because it was all um, wrapped up quite tightly, and I could only get at a tiny piece of it. So I'm testing it, trying to decide whether it's gonna work or not, and I can only get my fingers around a tiny piece, and I pull on it, and it, like it barely moves, you know? And I'm like, I can't, I'm like, ah. Uh. You know, that doesn't seem like it's gonna work. It, it's not, the elasticity is not strong enough for what I need, you know? I was looking at it, testing it with my fingers like this, and I was like, nah, I don't think that's gonna work. But then I realized I'm only testing a tiny piece of it and that if I unravel it, then maybe it's a different story. So I decided to take a chance on it and I decided to replace the shock cord on both of my tents, like both had needed to be replaced. Even if I only use one tent and just give away the other one, um, I, I would like to replace the shock cord on both. So I bought enough for both, which was, yeah, 28 feet per tent. This of course is all in meters and I did all the calculations and I ended up buying three six meter packages, 15 ringgit each. So it came to 45 ringgit and I walked out with it. And then when I brought it back here to the, uh, actually I did it right away. I went into the uh, MRT station and tore one open right away because I wanted to see whether it's going to work. And it turns out that when you have more of it, as you can see, obviously, it suddenly becomes much more, there's much more flex in it. I mean, if you're only testing a tiny piece, it's hard to judge. But once I had a big piece of it, it was like, ah. Uh. And I was thinking that maybe I could just double it up. So now it's going to be five millimeters, technically 2.5 plus 2.5, but you get much stronger pull. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe it'll work just like this, if not, I can double it up and then do it this way. So I decided to uh, give it a try. Getting out of decathlon was not easy. That was, that was another part of the whole new decathlon, the new world, because they have a system self-checkout. You know, we had the big signs everywhere that says cashier this way, cashier, cashier, cashier. So I followed the signs to cashier. Well, you really needed those signs because this store was so big and had such a open plan that you, once you're inside, it's really difficult to figure out how you get out again. There, there was, it was, anyway, I found it difficult. I couldn't find my way to the exit. And I, I, was, okay, I started following the cashier signs. So I get to where the cashier signs point me to, but there are no cashiers, which is kind of funny. They're all self-checkout. And then I'm, I'm fine, you know, learning how to do self-checkout, but they didn't accept anything I had, all I have is touch and go e-wallet. That's my only non-cash option. But everything they listed, it was like boost, e I don't know, they had a bunch of things there. They says we accept all these forms of payment, mainly debit cards and credit cards, and I don't have access to either of those. All I have is cash or touch and go e-wallet. And they couldn't accept any of that. So I'm standing around there for a long time trying to figure out how the heck do I get out of this place? Because there are no other cashiers anywhere. There's no bank of you know, cash registers anywhere. All there is is a self-checkout. And finally, one of the clerks you know, took pity on me, uh, came up to me, and, you know, you know, can, can I help you out, sir? And I said, yeah, I'd like to pay in cash, but I, I don't know how to do that. And they directed me to the, inform well, was basically an information counter. It didn't look, it wasn't a cash register at all. Like it didn't look like a typical checkout line, nothing like that at all. It was more like an information counter. It says, well, if you want to pay in cash, you have to go here. And that was like the only place you could go. It was kind of weird. So I go there and then I run into more problems because the woman's, you know, I'm spending 45 ringgit on some el elastic, basically, some elastic cord. And then she turns to me and said, uh, oh, can I have your email address, sir? And that kind of annoyed me right out of the gate. It's like, listen, I'm just here, like, 
I'm just buying some elastic band. Like, what do you need my email address for? Like, I don't, A, I don't want to give it to you just for reasons of privacy. And like, my email address is out there so much. I get so much spam email from so many companies, from so many people, so many scam emails, endless flows of scam emails. It's just, a, it's really bothersome to get so many of them. And I don't want to be handing out my email address willy nilly just to buy some elastic. So I told her, you know, I'd rather not give you my email address for that reason. And B, it's just a hassle. It's like, what am I going to do? Stand here and spell out my email address for you? Because it's quite a, quite a weird one and it's going to be hard to spell. And we're going to, I know, I'd, I'd rather not give you my email address. And she says, oh, okay, well, then, then I need your uh, phone number. And then I had the same feelings like, no, I, do, I don't want to give you my phone number because I get tons of, of spam calls on my phone as well. It's just all day long, my phone is beeping and doing all these things. And I do not want to just randomly give my phone number out. So I says, no, I'd rather not give you my uh, phone number either. And she says, well, then I can't sell you anything. Like at Decathlon, the only way you can make a purchase, you have to give them an email address or your phone number. And um, I pushed back a little bit. I was being a bit annoying about this whole thing. I was not being friendly or cooperative. And um, I, did, I told her I did not want to do that. And I was like two seconds away from just walking away. You know, I really wanted this cord, but at the same time, this just annoyed me. You know, at some point you have to fight back against the modern world a little bit. You know, where do you draw the line in the sand? And I, this it would really hurt me to not get this cord, but is it worth it to me just to stand on principle and not give you my phone number or email address? And um, yeah, she basically told me, yeah. Uh, she said it was because of legal reasons, you know, for lawyers and insurance. If something goes wrong with the elastic, um, there has to be some way for them. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a recall on the item. They need a way to contact me for legal reasons and insurance and liability, which is what I assumed. It's either that or marketing, you know, that's the two things they could be doing. And uh, she explained all that to me and I was just about to turn around and walk away. And then the 10% of me that is not a dummy finally kicked in and I realized I can give her any fake number I want, any fake email address. She's not going to know. So that is obviously what you should do in these situations. If they ask for your email address, don't refuse just give them a fake one and get on with your life. So I was like, ah, what a dummy. I don't have to give them my real one. So then I just gave her a fake email address off the top of my head. I just made one up and she typed it into her uh, system and I was able to buy my uh, shock cord. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad I still got that 10% of my brain that occasionally comes up with a, a good idea. So yeah, that was a good chunk of my morning. And then I came back here and I really enjoy doing stuff like this. I love it. I don't know, not, very few things give me more pleasure than sitting down with a physical project like replacing the shock cord in uh, my tents. I really enjoy stuff like that. And so I sat down and uh, I actually I fired up my tablet with some uh, you know, new TV shows and movies that I'm watching because I can have those playing in the background while I'm doing work like this. You know, it doesn't need my full attention. A lot of it is sort of just working through the steps. And it was really complicated because, you know, this is, these are the tent poles for my big Agnes. And I mean, it's a, it's a very complicated little thing here. And it's not, you have to figure out like, is it one piece of elastic? And if so, how in the world does it go through all of this? And it turns out it's made up of multiple pieces of elastic. There were one, two, three, four, five, six in total for the whole operation. And each one is held in place with these like screw in pegs with clips on the end. So you unscrew these and then you pull them out and there's a clip there. You can see I've got it, my elastic attached to this clip. And then on the other end, when it goes into one of these things, these little hubs, in the hub, it's got a special kind of plug that it attaches to and the plug has to be removed. And as you dismantle the tent and remove the old cord, you have to be very careful because you have to remember how it all goes back together. So you can't just sort of tear it apart 
and have all the pieces lying everywhere because I guarantee you, you're not going to remember how it goes back together. So you got to work through it methodically, take it apart piece by piece by piece, remove each piece of elastic systematically, and then replace it with the new one. And then I did it. Actually, I did my MSR first. So like, like here's one of the poles for my big Agnes and you can see that, da -da -da, so exciting. And then when you let go of it, you know, the elastic pulls it together and holds it together. It doesn't have to be like Superman strength. We're not talking about something that, you know, it's trying to keep it from pulling apart. No, it just wants to hold it in place while you're assembling your tent. And once your tent is assembled, you know, the tension of the tent itself is holding it. All you need the elastic to do is just a light little click, just to hold it together, you know. So that's what I did. And each piece of elastic, of course, has to be cut to the exact right length. If it's too long, then there's no pull on it. And if it's too short, it's too strong, it's too much, you gotta get it just right. So it takes time. And I did my MSR hubba hubba, finish that project and then I turn to the big Agnes. And I think that whole project doing both tents took four hours, maybe something like that. It took a long time to work through the steps, work through the whole system, um, getting it done. And I was distracted as well because I was watching TV at the same time. <laughs> so occasionally my attention would wander and I'd watch a little bit of the TV show, then go back to whatever I was doing. And, but yeah, I got it done, no problems. And um, I, had an, I had enough cord, I bought the right amount, and this 2.5 millimeter cord, eh, I'm not happy with it, but it works. So I, I'm, I'm pleased. I'd prefer if I had 3.5 millimeter, four millimeter, but 2.5, it's not really designed for these tents, but it'll work. It'll get the job done, at least uh, temporarily. So. That is the story of my uh, tents and uh, tent poles and the uh, shock cord. Well, I guess that is it for now. I was tempted to dive into the topic of pop culture because as I mentioned, when I was working on my tents the other day, I had my tablet set up and I was watching a bunch of new TV shows and new seasons of old TV shows and even a blockbuster movie. So yeah, I wanted to talk about all those things as well as some uh, YouTube thoughts. But I've got to get started with my day today, so I think I will leave it there with uh, the behind the scenes uh, discussions. Time to uh, get ready and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, I, if I'm going to be uh, cycling through Sumatra very soon, I, I have to get going. I've, I've got things I need to do. So time to get started and I'll see you in the next video.